button. Here we go. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Visual Studio Office Hours. My name is Matt Christensen, and um, I'm coming to you uh, live here from my garage in Redmond. And uh, today is very exciting because uh, I'm a long-term web developer, uh, and there is this new thing out there called Blazor for ASP.NET. Uh, and uh, I haven't actually looked too much into it, and I'm very curious as to what this thing is. And um, there's no better person to explain this whole thing to me than uh, Mr. Dan Roth himself from the Blazor team. Hello, Dan. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on the show, Mads. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm the program manager for, for Blazor at Microsoft on the ASP.NET team. All right. And so, yeah, and you've been you've been on the ASP.NET team for uh, for quite a few years and been around the block. You know your thing about ASP.NET, I think. It's <laughs> and a uh, little bit, a little bit. I, I you know I came came on to ASP.NET. I don't know, like five to seven years ago. I actually don't remember exact the exact time frame anymore. It has been long enough that I've forgotten the exact exact, exact period. Mm -hmm. um, but I started working on um, ASP.NET uh, Web API. Actually, was where I really uh, joined with ASP.NET. I mean, I guess technically, if you go back far enough, I actually worked on ASP.NET web services. Like, do you remember the old, like, Asmx style SOAP services? I, I worked on that. Oh. So that technically had some some ASP.NET uh, code in there as, as well. Uh, but for web UI, that's more recent. Like, I, I really started working on web UI with uh, MVC4 and MVC5 on ASP.NET. OK, I didn't know you did the old the ASMX stuff. So this was. I don't know if the audience remember back in like 2000, Visual Studio 2005, 8, and all that sort of stuff we had. You could right click your project and go say add service reference, and you could point to an ASMX file, which was kind of like a web forms, but for that would generate SOAP APIs. Is that is that how, kind of how it was? It was, it was for uh, consuming services, right? Like you wanted to build uh, an endpoint for your back end, and you wanted to be able to easily consume it from you know whatever code a web app a, a desktop application um yeah it's all the the, the soap based services era um i actually joined microsoft uh right when wcf was being was being put together and developed um asmx was sort of one of the precursors or asp.net web services was one of the precursors to wcf so i worked on that for a good long while mostly as a uh, fo focused on the back end right like back end services back end server infrastructure uh, it's only more recently at my time at microsoft that i've been working on front end web ui yeah you know i i remember back then uh, i built like phone app this is back when there was uh, w um Windows, this is before Windows Phone, it was called Windows Mobile, and it was called Windows Pocket PC. And the cool thing about that, you know, as well as WinForms, this is before WPF, um, and of course, ASP.NET, and they were all able to talk SOAP in a very, very easy way through like add service reference, point to an endpoint that had an ASMX file, which was a very simple and easy way to construct SOAP from, like it really democratized the service-oriented architecture, I feel like, back then. And we never really got it back, right? It, it, <laughs> we, I don't know what happened, but it kind of the world went into REST APIs and JSON. And in the process, we lost that, you know, you know, maybe things that people really hate about SOAP, which was the schemas and the weird authentication and, and security models and all this sort of stuff. But, uh, but the ease of use and, and the ability for me to very easily create a SOA, uh, service-oriented architecture kind of died and now it's very manual and it's very like you have to learn a lot of things it's not the tooling doesn't kind of just help you along in a very net, natural way uh i don't know am i being nostalgic or or did we lose something there dan there there, there it, it, i mean the, the what happened i think with with soap was that uh soap as with the tooling involved you could generate code from these just this description language, right? Like it was, it wasn't actually the ASMX file you pointed Visual Studio at. It was a a a, a web service description language file, a WSDL file, right? That uh, was a big chunk of XML that described all the endpoints on that service that was generated by the ASP.NET Web Service or WCF uh, service. And then Visual Studio could generate a whole bunch of code based off of that description language that you could then use to send the actual SOAP messages and all the protocol details. Uh, you didn't have to really worry about it. you just call it c-sharp code and 
mostly that that mostly that just worked. Um, with the move to web APIs, I think the the desire there was to um, simplify really the the amount of machinery between you and actually sending that that message. Um, I think there there was a big reaction of why not just use HTTP as as you know Tim, Tim Berners Lee in, intended. It's you know supposed to be an application level protocol. Why do I need all this additional abstraction on top of that? I'm just going to send an HTTP request with some some data in there, and that's probably good enough. Uh, and for a lot of scenarios, that does actually simplify things a lot because SOAP required a fairly thick tool chain to make it productive. If you if you had Visual Studio, then it was it was great. If you were in a platform that didn't really have like a SOAP stack, then it was like terrible. It was just like on iPhones for a long time. The only way to send a SOAP message was to like string concatenate a bunch of XML together, and you know that was just like ah terrible. Whereas sending an HTTP request was pretty straightforward. So there was a, some simplicity. Uh, that came with the the web API uh, movement and a lot of the code generation type features have been coming back actually in, in ASP.NET Core we did a bunch of work I think in, in .NET Core 3.0 or .NET Core 3.1 where you can take an API and generate a similar description document from it um, it's not a WSDL file it's a uh, you know open API specification um, which describes the API and then Visual Studio does have tooling where you can then generate code uh, from that uh, description document in order to call that API in a, in a strongly typed way. So some of these features have have made their way back. Uh, but personally, honestly, I love just taking like HTTP client and um, maybe using some of the like there's some new JSON extension methods that the .NET team put out uh, using system text JSON and HTTP client together in a in a strongly typed way. You just take an object. Put it into an HP request, get get a get an object back. It's all handling the JSON serialization for you. Um, that's honestly how I, I like to do things now. But uh, if you want that sort of code generated uh, client, there is that as available as well. Okay, so that's good news. I was not aware of of uh, that. That uh, that makes me a little bit excited because it was it was the ease of use and the get going quickly and robustly. That was at the same time. It felt like that was. Um, that was a good selling point for me when I think about back then. You know, WCF services was the same thing because it still produced a WSTL document if you use SOAP and not. I think it also had remoting capabilities and other protocols, or whatever. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't remember. I just remember the SOAP part, which um, I'm not a fan of SOAP, but I was a fan of the experience. Anyway, this is a segue into into Blazor. That's all about that. Blazor, right? We just talked all about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. This is this. Folks out there, this is about Blazor, so don't worry. <laughs> and for those of you that are live on the broadcast right now, uh, there's a Q&A panel uh, on your right-hand side. So go check that out, ask some comments as we go along, and we will answer them. Um, all right, so um, Dan, so Blazor. So ASP.NET has come a, you know, a long way. Of course, it started with ASP and then became ASP.NET around the year 2000 and 2001. And that was web forms. And then we had MVC come in around the year 2009, 2010, I think. Phil Hack started that project. Mm -hmm. And that became Web API. That became, you know, then .NET Core came along. And, you know, a, 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 Part of all of this was uh, the sort of the birth of the client side frameworks as well, like Angular, of course, were the big ones, Knockout. You know, there were the, the, the data binding frameworks and then there were the full application frameworks. Um, React now is, is probably king. Vue.js is another one. Um, so when you set out and said, okay, let's look at, like, like in, in that world where we had already strong server side ASP.NET components in MVC and Razor pages and so on, and we already had the client side components that were really strong, such as React and Angular. How did Blazor fit into that story at the time? Yeah, so um, that, that's exactly right. Like that's the, the history of web development with .NET is that we've always had a really strong story for building web applications that are server rendered. Right, like you, you write some .NET code, uh, you stick it on your server. Uh, a, a request comes in, and that .NET code runs and does some fancy stuff to generate a dynamic HTML response, or maybe some some JSON in the the response, like Web API would do, and that then gets rendered by the browser. 
Um, if you wanted to do anything client side, anything that actually ran on the user's machine, like in the browser on the user's device, well, that meant you had to write JavaScript because that's the only thing that historically browsers have been able to execute is just JavaScript. So you had to use a JavaScript based framework to do any client side based logic. And you know, JavaScript is, is great, has a fantastic ecosystem. It's come a long way since its very humble beginnings. Um, but I think having to bridge those two ecosystems, like having to bridge JavaScript, the JavaScript world and the .NET world, it, it comes with a cost. Like there are two different runtimes, two different frameworks, two different languages. Um, I often make the analogy to human spoken languages, like having to write your application in both .NET in JavaScript is like having to learn a second language. And for, so for many people, learning multiple languages is fine. Like I have a, a sister in law who knows like seven languages and doesn't mind picking up new languages at all, like human spoken languages. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, learning a new language is a pretty big investment. Like I can say, you know, hello and where's the bathroom and in Portuguese, but that's that's about it. I'm certainly not fluent. If I if I had my choice, I normally would speak in English. And if I'm writing code, I normally would prefer to write .NET code because that's where my skills are. That's that's where I'm fluent. Um, that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, and fortunately, the web community agreed, and the browsers, all the browser vendors, got together and said, "Hey, let's let's standardize." a a bytecode for the web, a low level bytecode format for the web that's called WebAssembly. And so now browsers don't just speak JavaScript, they also speak this low level bytecode format that runs in, it's now implemented in all the browsers. It's uh, WebAssembly supported um, all the desktop browsers, all the mobile browsers. And the idea there is as long as you could compile your code to WebAssembly or run it on WebAssembly, you can now write your code in any language that you want and have it run in any browser uh, on any device uh, at near native speeds. Um, and so that's what really then opened the door to have not just JavaScript, but other development platforms running in browsers. And Blazor was a project that we kicked off to uh, enable full stack web development with .NET, where you can use your whatever skills or your, 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 your language that you're fluent with, your .NET tool belt, be able to use it not only on the backend server, but also be able to use it client side in the browser. Okay, so that's very fascinating. Does that mean that I can sh like I can share code between them? So, like if I have a if I have some object models or whatever in C sharp that I'm going to use on the server, can I use them on the client as well? It used to be like with JavaScript, you had to like duplicate your object model in, in JavaScript as you pass yep. things and forth. So, is that a benefit here? Absolutely, yeah. That's that's one of the big benefits is that you can you can share code. Um, in fact, when you create a Blazor WebAssembly based uh, application, um, we set you up this way. We give you the we give you a server project, which is just an ASP.NET Core project, you know, standard ASP.NET Core application where you can have your web APIs and any server rendering logic that you want. We give you a client project, which is the actual Blazor WebAssembly app. That's the .NET code that's going to get downloaded to the browser and executed client side. And then we also give you a third project, a shared project, which is just like a it's just a normal .NET standard class library, but it's referenced by both the client and server. And that's where you can put like a, a object a object models or any shared validation logic that you want to have on both the client and the server. And that same DLL, like the, literally the same file gets used on both sides of the wire, both client and server. OK, that that's amazing. That's like the holy grail of <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of a lot of these things. I know that, you know, on the, in the node JS world, the idea of what do they call it? Isomorphic um, development or ISO something, right? Where you you code the same in the client and on the server is a big deal. And I guess now we have that and on the ASP.NET stack as well. Yeah, it's a huge savings. Like you, you no longer have to bridge these two worlds. You can just write in one language. You can reuse the code. You, you get full stack web development with .NET. That's what Web Blazor was, was really all about. Um, so yeah, that, and that, there's been quite a bit of excitement about that because I think it is really enabling. Like I remember the first time that uh, I sat down with the original Blazor prototype, uh, which was implemented by a, a dev on our team named uh, Steve Sanderson. Uh, it was actually just about three years ago today. It was in it was in uh, July of 2017. Um, Steve was doing a talk at NDC Oslo, 
and he was it was just a, it was just a talk about things that browsers can do at the time that you may not know about you know new browser features and one of the new browser features was WebAssembly and Steve had this idea you know for a demo wouldn't it be cool if I could get some .NET code running in the browser uh, on WebAssembly and he managed to find this little uh, little .NET IL interpreter called um, .NET Anywhere DNA. It was on GitHub. It was written by some I forget the guy's name at Google. I, re I really should remember his name, but it was written like you know years and years ago. It was all written in C, and at the time, um, the only thing you could really do with WebAssembly was take some some C code or C++ code, run it through the Inscript and Toolchain, and generate some WebAssembly from it so that you could then run it in a browser. And so Steve took this code and tweaked it a little bit and got it built as WebAssembly and managed to get Hello World running for the first time in a browser all written in C Sharp. Um, but of course, this is Steve Sanderson, so he didn't just stop there. He was like, wow, that's interesting. Um, Steve, if you don't know Steve, he's also the author of Knockout JS, um, you know, fairly popular JavaScript uh, front end framework. So he's, he's familiar with the JavaScript world and he, he handles a lot of the integrations that we do with uh, front end JavaScript frameworks. And so he thought, well, maybe I could write a little web UI framework using this. And so he wrote a .NET component model and, and web UI framework on top of that runtime, which he named Blazor. Um, where did that name come from? Well, it's Browser plus Razor, because Razor is the um, HTML and C Sharp templating language that we use for, for ASP.NET web applications. And he used that same format for writing components. So browser plus race, where's the L come from? He said it just sounded better. Uh, I think at one point he <laughs> joked that it was because of blockchain, but we, we don't really know. I guess it's, it's, he just stuck it in there. Um, and he got that framework working. And then he also did like Visual Studio tooling for it. Like he knew enough of the Razor editor to like get into its innards and enable like IntelliSense and completions for components and stuff. And he did this demo at NDC Oslo, at just a demo, right? Where he showed, oh, here, I'm going to write some .NET code with a bunch of UI components and get it running completely in the browser on this WebAssembly thing. There, full stack web development with .NET. And it was just like, <laughs> mind blown. And I remember sitting down with that prototype for the first time and feeling like, wow, you know, I, I, I know some JavaScript, but it's not really my strength. And I've always kind of, uh, you know, I kind of fumble around with it. I feel like I it can now be productive writing client-side web UI, and it was great. And uh, that was the beginning of the Blazor project. Wow, <laughs> that's a that's a quite a cool beginning. I think uh, I think your team has a few of those type of moments, right? I think wasn't SignalR kind of a similar similar story where, you know, could we do it for fun or I want to show something and then SignalR came out of it and became a huge hit, right? Uh, it's that's like a great a, question. Like a, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, that's a Damian Edwards and David Fowler question. I, I, I don't know the exact uh, uh, conception story <laughs> for for Signal R, but probably, yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. So sometimes you just have to go with your instinct when you see something cool and and you know make it happen. I guess. <laughs> yeah, and okay. it, uh, so you know, honestly, when we started it, it wasn't. I mean, a lot of people were were very impressed, but there was also a lot of skepticism because uh, the, the there were a lot of front end frameworks very well established. Uh, Angular and, and and React, I think, came uh, was either around there, but it was maybe a little earlier in its its history. But still, these were very well established front end frameworks, and there were some questions like, is this is can this really stand on its own in this in this world of of such dominant JavaScript players? Um, that's why we kicked off the project initially as an experimental project. Like if you followed along with Blazor early on, uh, it was experimental. It wasn't even preview. It was like you know pre-alpha. We weren't even sure if it was going to go anywhere, uh, and we we weren't ready to even commit that it would become a thing. Uh, but after shipping like you know nine some odd experimental releases of it, and uh, the, the community really seemed to rally behind it and was getting pretty excited, uh, we finally made that. That pivot to say, yeah, let's 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 productize this thing. Let's let's take this WebAssembly.NET runtime and, and turn it into something that people can really use in production. And it just ships. Like so, we we shipped Blazor WebAssembly just in May of of this year. It was a almost a three year journey to finally get it out the door and make it ready for for people to use. Um, a little bit before that, we shipped the another version of Blazor, uh, slightly different that we call Blazor Server, in .NET Core 3.0. And it shipped again with .NET Core 3.1 LTS. Uh, Blazor is a little bit closer to like a traditional .NET web app in that all the code still runs on the server side, 
Uh, but what we do is we set up a WebSocket connection with the browser that's just live, and um, it uses the same component model as Blazor running on, in the browser on WebAssembly, but the components run on the server and all the UI interactions happen over that real-time connection. So you like click on a button in the browser, that button click gets sent to the server over that WebSocket connection. The component runs, it does its rendering on the server. Blazor figures out what needs to be updated in the DOM on the server and sends that DOM diff back down to the browser and updates the, the browser then client side. So it's a much thinner uh, client piece. Most of the logic runs on the server, but it still enables that like rich interactive feel that you would expect from a spa style application, right? You can click on things and update the UI without having to do a, a, a whole page refresh. So that, that also shipped um, uh, late last year in like September, and I think uh, then again in December of, of uh, 2019. Okay, uh, so we got a few questions here related to this. Um, so you said that it's, you know, Blazor shipped in 3.1. Uh, .NET Core 3.1. Is that uh, is that ready for production? Is it like is it in a preview or is it final? Like, what's the and and, and is it like would you recommend people um, using it in production today? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's shipped. It is ready for production. I mean, Blazor Server has shipped twice already. It shipped in .NET Core 3.0 and then shipped again with .NET Core 3.1. .NET Core 3.1 is a LTS or long-term support release. So it's got a nice long support horizon on it. Um, people are using it today for all sorts of things. Uh, Blazor WebAssembly just shipped, um, you know, a little about two months ago now um, with, uh, and it's it's in the .NET Core 3.1 SDK. Um, we haven't actually declared Blazor WebAssembly an LTS release yet. It was the first release of Blazor WebAssembly. So, uh, it is a, a supported release, but it's called a, a current release. Um, all that means is that when we ship Blazor WebAssembly again with .NET 5, which uh, we are working on right now, that, that will ship later this year, you'll be expected to upgrade. And that upgrade should be really seamless. Like we are, we're expecting to have a, a very high compatibility bar from the um, Blazor WebAssembly uh, .NET Core 3.1 based release and the .NET 5 release. But both are, are absolutely supported um and are ready for production use right now awesome uh we got another question here um which is about like what languages are supported you mentioned c sharp are other dotnet languages uh supported as well well fundamentally blazor is just best based on dotnet and dotnet il so if, if it compiles to dotnet il you can use it in a blazor app um there is one con language constraint which is blazor is heavily based on razor and Razor in .NET Core is HTML and C Sharp. Um, if you've never seen a Razor file before, it looks like a, a mixture of HTML markup and then uh, interweaved with C Sharp code. And then at build time, what happens is that file gets turned into a, a, a normal C Sharp class where all the uh, markup rendering logic is captured in that class. And then when your uh, Blazor component or your MVC view or your Razor Pages page renders that that C sharp class is just executed as a compiled uh, uh, .NET class at at, at runtime uh, because the Razor format itself is C sharp based. Like there's no VB variant of uh, Razor in .NET Core, or in the, and there's no F sharp variant of of Razor in .NET Core either. Um, that Razor file actually does need to live in a C sharp project. So the place where you use your write your razor code that needs to be um, that needs to be in a C sharp project. But anything else like your business logic, um, you know, any other code that you want to reference or use from that application, you can put that in like a a VB.NET project or an F sharp project. Reference that from your Blazor app, and you're and you're good to go. Okay, awesome. So any .NET language, so there's some, there's COBOL.NET. There's all. I think back <laughs> in the day with .NET started, I think there were over 20 languages because you can add you can add your own language to .NET. By the way, in case you're wondering, and so people did, <laughs> which was kind of funny. Um, there was LOL code. LOL code. I don't know if you are familiar with that. That's a. No, what is that? <laughs> it was. It was. A, it's a. It's a fantastic language that no one ever wrote anything interesting in, but um, it was just a joke. But yeah. <laughs> Go look it up if you haven't seen it. It's it's uh, hilarious. Um, I kind of wonder if uh, if that may come back because I, I feel like in the Java world, like with the JVM, there's been this um, growth in JVM based languages on top of 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 of, uh, of that ecosystem, like you know Kotlin and Scala and these types of things. Like you know, for a long time, it was just basically just Java, 
And then those languages kind of came along. With .NET, it was almost kind of the inverse, right? Like we, we had a sort of explosion of, of .NET uh, runtime-based languages, and then it kind of was kind of whittled down. And I wonder if at some point there may be more interest in uh, doing language-based innovation on top of the, the .NET runtime. But we'll just see, yeah. see what people come up I with. Think, I think that's how F Sharp came to be, right? There was there was a demand for like a functional language on top of the object-oriented that we had, C Sharp and, and Visual Basic .NET. And, uh, and it, it, I think that's how F Sharp started. So I think the difference is that it had a company supporting it uh, year after year. I think Scala and Kotlin, they also have organizations behind them to to um, sustain them and maintain them over time. So maybe that's the trick. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to see. See, yeah. see what the future holds. OK, so I remember like back three years ago, <clears throat> and I was on the ASP.NET team. I think it was, or I just left the ASP.NET team at the time. And we talked about it, and you had this uh, idea about bringing the web assembly this is before it was even called well, maybe it was called Blazor, uh, but the idea of .NET Web Assembly, and I think at the time, you and I talked about it. You mentioned that yeah, you know, right now it's based on was it Mono runtime? That actually, so you had to include the entire Mono runtime in the Web Assembly that you sent to the browser that the browser has to download just to say hello world. So you're a very simple hello world web page, like a completely white blank uh, web page that just says <laughs> hello world in text would actually include the entire mono runtime to be able to do that. And I, I, I forget the numbers, but it was something like, yeah, it's like four megabytes or eight megabytes, I think it was, just to do that. And of course, that was prototype and all that sort of stuff. But where where are you now in that journey as we, you know, if the competition is, is like React and React is like a smaller JavaScript library or whatever, like how does how does the Blazor WebAssembly stack up against those? Well, for, well, first of all, Blazor WebAssembly app is not four or eight megabytes today. Just so, just so you know, the, uh, the the published download size for like a default Blazor WebAssembly app, if you just create a new project, publish it, um, that app will weigh in about like 1.7, 1.8 megs uh, transferred size for for the application, and that includes everything. That includes the .NET runtime that, yep, you are you are bringing a runtime along with your app. It includes all of the core framework library dependencies that you need for that application. It includes your app assembly with your own components and your app logic, as well as any other stuff that you decide to include in your web app, like our templates include Bootstrap, so it includes the, the Bootstrap styles and any other dependencies that, that Bootstrap has in that app. So Blazor WebAssembly apps, they are still heavier than like, uh, you know, really, optimized and tree-shaken um, JavaScript-based applications. So you do pay uh, an overhead for download size and, and startup time with this model. That, that, is, that is absolutely true. Um, we are bringing a runtime with the app. The runtime that we're using is the uh, mono.net IL interpreter based, based runtime. That's how the, the code is executed. And it is brought in as a, a WebAssembly bundle. That's actually the only piece of WebAssembly in the application. Once you have the runtime, we just boot, we boot it up, we start it up in, in the browser, and then it executes normal .NET assemblies uh, directly in the browser. So it kind of weirds people out actually when they look at the network trace for a Blazor WebAssembly app because they'll see like all these DLLs like come down with the app, and they're like, "Whoa, why are DLLs <laughs> being downloaded by the browser?" And some people actually even get worried about like security. Is like, is that is that safe? Is that okay? Um, the WebAssembly code that's running those DLLs is actually running in the same security sandbox that JavaScript code runs in. So those DLLs can't do anything that you couldn't do with JavaScript. They can't like go randomly touch the file system. They can't open random network connections, none of that stuff. It's it's in the same browser security sandbox that you would get if you wrote an Angular app or a React app. Uh, but yeah, you are bringing that, that down with the application. Um, some people also get concerned about the fact that it's mono and they ask us, well, why is it not .NET Core? Um, with uh, one of the big efforts that's actually happening right now on the .NET team is this uh, unification of all of the different .NETs that we have either implemented or accumulated over the years. Um, you know, we had originally had .NET Framework, right? That's the .NET that shipped with Windows and powered many .NET apps for, for many, many long years. .NET Core was an effort to make uh, a cross-platform version of .NET that could run server applications. And then more recently, they just added support for desktop apps like WinForms and uh, WPF. Mono originated externally from Microsoft, 
um, as a cross-platform implementation of the, the .NET framework. It got the most traction in the mobile world, like through, through Xamarin. Uh, Xamarin used Mono to enable .NET scenarios on iOS and, and Android devices. Uh, Xamarin is now part of the, the Microsoft Fold, so all the te technologies is just now part of .NET. But there's obviously some reconciliation that needs to happen there. Like there's stuff that Mono has and that .NET Core has that kind of overlap, and we'd like to unify so that you know it's less engineering cost for us to not have to maintain two things, and it's better for customers because it means you get a more consistent experience and you get more features because we have more time to, to build those features. Uh, that's a big theme for the .NET 5 and .NET 6 wave. Uh, if you've read uh, Scott Hunter's like uh, vision blog post on .NET 5, he talks about this one .NET vision. Like let's let's not have two different implementations of the core framework libraries. Let's let's get rid of the the overlap and just have one .NET. Uh, and that is happening right now. Like uh, in .NET 5, actually, we're still using the Mono based IL interpreter, and it's it's kind of disingenuous actually to still keep calling it the mono IL interpreter in my opinion because it's really now the .NET IL interpreter for all of .NET. We don't, it's not like we have multiple of those so that will continue to live on. If you want to do IL interpretation that's the the code base that we intend to use. Um, but for the core framework libraries in .NET 5 we were using the mono based implementations of those libraries in the most recent Blazor WebAssembly release. And for .NET 5, we're replacing those with the .NET 5 uh, core library implementations. Uh, so that gives us you know, one code base, and it also expands the API surface area that we now have available for Blazor WebAssembly and .NET 5. Before we targeted um, .NET Standard 2.1, in .NET 5, we'll target the .NET 5 surface area. Um, so yeah, we you, you do bring the runtime with you. It is the its lineage of the IL interpreter is mono, but really you should just think of it as the .NET IL interpreter for, for all of .NET. Um, and we do a lot of work to trim things down to make them small. So when you publish that app, uh, we will run an, an IL linker over all of your .NET IL code to strip out all of the unused codes that we can, we can, we can detect uh, using uh, static analysis. Um, and there's actually a lot of investment happening in the .NET 5 and probably also in the .NET 6 timeframe to improve IL linking in .NET so we can have standalone executables that are that are really small. Um, that that helps to reduce the size quite a bit. We also um, uh, statically pre-compress all of the built assets using Broadly, like maxed up to the its highest, highest setting. So when you finish the, the published output, everything has been IL linked and also pre-compressed to be as uh, small as it can be using the highest Broadly settings. You then deploy those assets to, uh, to your, you know, a static, you can deploy them as a static site or you can deploy them to like an Azure app service um, and they are, you know, it, it's it's a little bigger than, uh, than you could get with JavaScript, but it's still for many applications quite reasonable. All right, so a few questions there. So um, so do you depend on Broadly? Like what if the browser does not support that uh, um, shipping algorithm? Will you fall back to GZIP or like, what is the lowest, what is the browser support here? Does, is, does it work in Internet Explorer? Does it work in the pre-Chromium versions of Edge, for instance? Yeah, that's a great question. So for Blazor WebAssembly, obviously you need support for WebAssembly. So you're gonna need a modern browser that has WebAssembly support, all the, all the, existing modern browsers support WebAssembly, so that's generally not an issue. Uh, it happens to be that also the same browsers that support WebAssembly, they all support Broadly. So if, if, if you have one, then you, auto, you automatically get the other. Uh, IE does not support WebAssembly, and it will never support WebAssembly. So no, you can't run a Blazor WebAssembly app in IE. Um, IE does support uh, WebSockets though, so you can uh, build a Blazor server application and have that work with, with IE. Um, that works just fine uh, with the there's I think there's some polyfills that you do have to add still for IE to get that to work, but it, uh, it is a supported scenario. Um, so you're looking at basically Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Safari on desktop, mobile browsers. If you have a you know reasonably current version of all those browsers, then you should be good, good to go with Blazor. If you need IE 11 support, then uh, Blazor server is what we would, we would recommend that you then use for that scenario. OK, so here's a question for you. Um, Shady asks, uh, do you think browsers will include the framework to run Blazor in the browser so the megabytes to download will be very small? 
That would be nice. Yes. So, so we, should, we should ask them to do that. Um, it'd be great to have some way to pre-cache the, these, these assets with the, with the browser. Um, I don't know, honestly, of a path currently that would allow us to do that so that before your app even runs, those, those assets are already there. But those assets do get downloaded to the browser using the normal HTTP mechanism. So once they're downloaded, they are cached. In fact, we handle a lot of that for you. Like we will... We, once once we've downloaded the runtime and the framework assemblies, we put them into the uh, the app cache for for that application, and we set up a, like a manifest with hashes of all the assets so that we can very efficiently detect if anything in the app has changed. If we need to, you know, invalidate the cache and grab a new version of the app. So the second time you load the application, you don't see any of the traffic for the runtime or the DLLs because they're already downloaded and installed. Uh, well, not installed, but you know, cached uh, in the browser. So. So browser-based caching mechanisms, that all works perfectly fine. You can put those assets on a CDN as well. Um, that also works. Um, so you can get CDN-based uh, optimizations for your application as well. Would it make sense? And and so the runtime itself, you download, that's a separate download. So that that will be cached you know, between you make updates to your app code. If it's on the same runtime, you might already have it cached in the browser. Is that... Do I understand that right? No, the, the, typically the, the, the runtime and the framework libraries are still downloaded per app. So it's not like you download it once and then every app gets them. Um, the, I mean, I think there used to be capabilities in the browser where you could like point at a common resource, uh, download it and cache it. And then if someone else pointed at the same resource, like a, the same CDN, for example, the browser would reuse that asset. I think browsers have generally moved away from that model due to security concerns. Um, so you, even if you try to like uh, pre-cache the, uh, the the downloaded assets with one app and then use it from another, I think browsers in general will will not let you do that. But for at least for that app, once the user has browsed to that app the first time, when they browse to that app again, um, the uh, the the runtime and the framework libraries are already there. So the download size of that second hit is actually pretty small. It, you you actually can see this when you create your first Blazor WebAssembly app. If you create the app, you build it, you run it. The caching um, happens uh, on that first hit. So you hit the you hit the HTML page for the app. It downloads a little uh, a bootstrapping JavaScript uh, file to uh, download the runtime, download the framework library, set everything up, and then fire up the runtime for you. All the runtime assets are now cached at that point. If you then try to go to the network tab and see, oh, how big is this app? And so you you know Control F5 to see the app. It'll look really really tiny in development. Uh, because, well, everything was cached up after that first hit and you didn't see the network tab on the first hit. So if you really want to go see where the assets are, you have to go digging around in the uh, browser app cache, uh, part of the uh, the application tab and the browser dev tools. Um, during development, we don't run the IL linker and we um, uh, don't do pre-compression. So the download size during development will look significantly larger. Like I think it's in .NET 5, it's now like, it is like eight megabytes or something like eight or nine megabytes uh, during development. But that's okay because you know you're on the dev machine downloading those files is fast because it's all locally on your on your box. When you go to publish, then all the optimizations kick in to reduce the size of application and make it nice and tight and 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 reasonable to download. Okay, so that's like the debug versus release builds uh, yeah. kind of concept there. Um, okay, so yeah, I remember like jQuery. It used to be like you would you would point to the Google CDN or jQuery at I think at the end had their own CDN. And so if every website got their jQuery.js from the same URL, then the browsers all had them cached. And But you're saying this is no longer the case? I don't think that works really. Any, I, mean, I could be wrong. If, if some, someone feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But from what I understand, like uh, trying to use a common CDN pattern like that, br browsers have moved away from that kind of cross app code sharing due to um, some security concerns that I don't, I don't, I'm not the best person to say the details oh. of. I just remember looking into it and hoping that, oh, maybe we could, maybe we could leverage this. And uh, it turned out that most browsers have, have disabled that, that capability. For um, caching, specifically, they don't cache the off domain JavaScript files or something. They won't cache the files across apps. Like okay. they won't, you can't have a shared, shared resource like that, is, is my understanding. If I'm wrong, Please open a GitHub issue on the ASP.NET Core repo and tell us how we could achieve this, because that would be great. If there was a way to actually download Blazor's runtime once and have it be reused, that could be a big win for a lot of people. I'm not aware of, of a way to currently do it, though. So let us know if you if you have a clever idea. 
Uh, I have an idea slash question. <laughs> so you mentioned you're doing a manifest. So um, is this a web manifest? Like, do you actually create like a service worker where you do some aggressive caching and setting up potential offline capabilities as well? Uh, because I know when you do a service worker, that's a JavaScript concept. Um, there are a bunch of caching, like it's a, it gives you the opportunity to be way more aggressive when it comes to caching and way more granular. And you can really control things instead of kind of leaving it to the browsers. And um, and then I also wonder uh, if if maybe that could be a mechanism to have that shared component living on the ASP.NET CDN as a service worker up there that will then, uh, you kind of install a service worker to the browser. It's kind of weird. Uh, but if that then gets installed to the browser, uh, then others can use it or, or there's something there. I don't know. Have you, is that right? Do you do service worker and web manifests? So we we do have the, uh, like we do set an app up with a service worker and a web manifest when you set the option that you'd like to create a progressive web app. So you can create progressive web apps with with Blazor, and that enables scenarios like offline support, installability. Uh, you can do push notifications. All those standard PWA uh, features can be done with with Blazor. And in fact, we have a template option where you can say, "Please you know, create this project, set it up as a PWA, and we'll give you that that service worker uh, and the web manifest." Um, the service worker that we give you uh, when you publish the app, it does handle offline uh, scenarios, so it will handle caching the assets of the application uh, so that they are available offline, so that you can run the app without having any sort of network connection. And that, yeah, that's that's supported today. Um, the mechanisms that you, if you haven't selected the PWA option, we still cache the the files that are downloaded locally, but the, it's not a um, it's not set up for an offline uh, logic because I believe it's the service worker that basically kind of intercepts the HTTP request and says, no, 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 I've got that already. It's right here. Let me give it to you. So you need that additional logic to get offline to work. Uh, all we do in the non PWA case is just make sure the files are cached so that the app loads faster on the second second refresh. All right. Um, so here's a, here's a related question about um, performance in general. So when you're running uh, C sharp in WebAssembly in the browser, and you know um, how does that compare from a performance perspective to let's say React or Angular? Yeah, um, it's it's unfortunately not going to win any uh, uh, speed competitions <laughs> with React and Angular. Um, this is something that we are uh, actively working on right now. Uh, remember I said that the runtime is an IL interpreter based runtime. Now most of the time with, with .NET, you're not running on an IL interpreter. You're running on a JIT based runtime where the IL code is just in time compiled to native code on the machine and that's what makes it really, really fast. And .NET is ridiculously fast. .NET Core on the uh, like public benchmarks, like the Tekken Power benchmarks, it just crushes like in terms of server performance and throughput, it is amazing. So definitely go check out the Tekken Power benchmarks if you haven't seen those yet. But when you're running in the browser, the runtime is just doing IL interpretation, and that is significantly slower than the JIT-based runtimes. And it, the, the, the code execution will also be significantly slower if you just ran JavaScript. The JavaScript runtimes are also are heavily optimized and they are very, you know, very performant in, in browsers. If you're doing CPU workload, uh, intensive workloads with JavaScript, you can get uh, good performance uh, in a browser and the the runtime we're using doesn't really compete. You know, I, it's not even ballpark close. Uh, so our, our goals, at least initially with Blazor WebAssembly, were we want to enable you to build rich, responsive UI. Um, the performance is sufficient for doing that, like you can build rich interactive user interfaces with, with Blazor WebAssembly. If you are trying to do CPU intensive tasks, like you're trying to build like a ray tracer that runs in the browser or you know a, bit, a Bitcoin miner or something like that, you're probably not gonna wanna do that with Blazor WebAssembly because the execution of that, that kind of CPU intensive code will be, will be slow. Um, what we plan to do to address that in the future is a couple things. For, for, for .NET 5, the plan is we are doing more work on the IL interpreter to make it as fast as we can. We're doing more work on Blazor's rendering pipeline so that it's as fast as we can. Basically, optimizing and tweaking um, the infrastructure that we already have that shipped um, with the Blazor WebAssembly release in, in May. Post.NET 5, the plan is AOT compilation. So ahead of time, comp compiling more of your .NET code all the way to, to WebAssembly. 
when you do that, the WebAssembly code is very fast. Like it is like within a, you know, a close approximation of native speed on the machine. It's one of the reasons why WebAssembly was invented. It, it was not just invented to broaden the developer ecosystem. It was also invented to give you more deterministic performance in a browser. Uh, JavaScript is it is heavily optimized and can be fast, but because of the dynamic nature of the JavaScript language, the JavaScript runtime often has to do these like this guesswork where it, it's it it thinks it knows what the code is doing, and so it will optimize it in a particular way. But then something dynamic happens where it's like, oh darn, like I was wrong, so I got to roll that back and optimize it differently. And that kind of uh, back and forth can result in some swings in performance in JavaScript runtimes. WebAssembly basically shortcuts a lot of that and says, no, 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 I'm just going to go all the way to that already um, uh, optimized code and give you much more deterministic performance in the browser. So if we can take your C-sharp code and turn it into WebAssembly, that does get significantly faster, and that is something we've been working on for a good long while. Um, we had actually hoped to ship it in .NET 5. Uh, originally, I had even published a, um, a .NET 5 roadmap for Blazor WebAssembly, and we had AOT on there, and people were really excited about it, and then we had to take it away. Um, what happened is that uh, the work to move from the mono framework libraries to the .NET 5 framework libraries is quite a bit of work. Um, and trying to get that done and do AOT all in the half of the .NET 5 release that we still have remaining just to, just didn't fit. Uh, so we ended up having to push it off to, to .NET 6, but we are going to do it. And when, when that shows up, that should give you um, great performance. There, there is a trade-off there that people should be aware of. Um, AOT compilation of .NET IL tends to also expand the size. Like if, the way you should think about this is think about the like native images that get generated from the .NET assemblies that are used in you know any .NET runtime. Those native images tend to be quite a bit larger than the original .NET assemblies. Some a similar phenomenon happens with uh, AOT compilation to WebAssembly. So there's this trade-off, right, where yeah, you can AOT compile some of your code, but it'll get bigger, and so that may you're, you're basically moving uh, trading off with load time then for for your application. So what we're thinking there is that um, you you probably want to AOT compile the performance critical hot paths in your app. Like you won't just AOT compile the whole thing. You'll you'll AOT compile the the parts that are really performance critical, and then the app will run in a mixed mode where some of the app is ahead of time compiled, the rest of it is being run as normal .NET assemblies. Um, that's really the tricky part to, to to get right, and why AOT needs a little bit more time. Um, we do have an implementation of AOT in, for, for, for Blazor WebAssembly. Um, and in fact, some uh, uh, other companies like the, the Uno folks, there's another company that have builds a, a WebAssembly based .NET um, uh, app platform using the UWP model. They've done a lot of experiments with the AOT model. Uh, but what, what I, from what I understand happens if you, if you try to use it today um, and you want to run in this mixed mode, linking the .NET assemblies to make them smaller gets broken because you, you AOT compile a bunch, of a bunch of code. It has these sort of fixed offsets that it uses to call then into the .NET code. And then when you link the .NET code, all that stuff gets scrambled and then nothing works anymore. So that's a bunch of work. It requires you know figuring out the right tool chain for how we handle that scenario. That's all stuff that's coming in the, the .NET 6 timeframe. So don't 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 go expecting that you're going to get you know amazing performance from this the .NET code in a Blazor WebAssembly app, but you uh, do get to take advantage of running on the client machine, take advantage of the you know the the memory, the storage, the CPU on that machine. Um, if you need code to run faster in that scenario, you have the option of either offloading that code back to the server because it'll run really fast on .NET Core. So put it behind a web API and and do it on the server, or you can also do JavaScript interop where you, you write that performance critical code in JavaScript, call into it from Blazor, which is fully supported, and then you can call back from JavaScript back into .NET to speed up certain uh, code paths using uh, using uh, targeted JavaScript. That's also a potential strategy. Okay. So, um, what, when is there like a, what in, in all the situations where I would use React or Angular, let's say today, like, would I use? Would I be able to use Blazor for the exact same use cases, or are there differences? Pretty much. Like, if you look at Blazor and you kind of squint, it basically kind of looks like React, but done in .NET and C sharp. 
it, they, they were Blazor was in particular heavily inspired by by React. So if you're familiar with React, you probably find a bunch of things in Blazor that feel very uh, uh, natural. So yeah, the things that you would normally do in React, you should be able to do in Blazor. Okay, but I don't need uh, a bunch of node modules and packages to to bundle all my JavaScript and compile all this sort of stuff and you know do npm restores and it's all <laughs> like within .NET. It's all within Visual Studio. There's no None of these sort of artifacts that you know. I know a lot of people really don't like them. That's right. Yep. Yeah. .NET new Blazor, or you can file a new project at Blazor WebAssembly app in Visual Studio. Control F5 or even F5. We actually support uh, full debugging of your Blazor WebAssembly code from VS, which requires some very interesting gymnastics <laughs> if you think yeah. about that one, because you're trying to remember the code's running not like locally on the machine it's running in a browser in mm -hmm. a like on WebAssembly in a dot in a on a javascript runtime effectively how do you debug your dot net code that's executing in the browser we do some very clever things there with a um uh debugging proxy that speaks the javascript debugging protocol and sort of augments it with dot net specific concepts in order to make that happen uh, you can even actually go into the browser dev tools and there's a gesture that will allow you to debug your .NET code in the browser using the normal Chrome or Edge browser dev tools, which is pretty cool. You can set breakpoints in like your Razor code and see that in the, the browser dev tools and hit that breakpoint all within the, the, the browser. So yeah, that, that whole experience end-to-end -end is very easy to get started with. If you want to get started with Blazor, just go to blazor.net, click on the Get Started button, and you can have your first Blazor app running in about five, 10 minutes. Oh, that's amazing. That sounds like magic. What you describe in the in the browser developer tools, uh, <laughs> I, I gotta try that. That's uh, pretty cool. <laughs> did you implement the debugger using the debug adapter protocol? Uh, just like we have the language server protocol that's shared between Visual Studio and VS Code, there's also something called debug adapter protocol. Mm -hmm. That is also something. Is, is that how you implement this? Well, remember we we have to connect to the to the browser, so we have to support whatever browser debugging endpoints it supports. And so that's why we plug through the uh, like the V8 uh, debugging protocol endpoint. Um, and the nice thing about doing that is, in addition to stepping through your C# -sharp code, if you do then do JavaScript interrupt, like if you call into some JavaScript, you can just keep stepping, and you can then step into the JavaScript code and then come back out again. Um, the way you can think about it, if if you're familiar with the JavaScript uh, script debugging features in Visual Studio, like where you attach to JavaScript code from VS. It's very similar infrastructure that we're using for, for Blazor, and it will work both for your .NET code and for your JavaScript code. Wow, okay. Um, so you mentioned you had the Blazor server, <clears throat> and which doesn't contain any of the WebAssembly. It, it contains a thin JavaScript layer on top of a, let's say, normal-ish Razor-based web app. And uh, all the client-side interactions actually takes place by proxying back and forth on your behalf over a WebSocket connection to make the changes in the DOM. This sounds a, a lot like, dare I say it, web forms and the Ajax control toolkit. Is there? <laughs> is there? It is a little similar, to be honest. In fact, Blazor in general, um, you know, it has a component model, so you're building reusable UI components. Um, it's very event driven. Like you, you click a button and you have a button click handler thing that you that you then write some code for. If you're familiar with web forms development, there's quite a bit in Blazor that kind of looks familiar to you. Now it is not web forms. Like let's, let's all be very clear. It's a very different. It, it is a different component model. A very different execution model. Um, but there are some things that will feel uh, familiar and natural if you're coming from a web forms background. And in fact, we've been working on a uh, on an ebook for a while uh, called Blazor for ASP.NET Web Forms Developers. That's available on the .NET site. That's specifically targeted for that crowd. If you're a web forms dev and you're kind of interested in getting started with Blazor, that book walks you through the Blazor concepts and how they relate to web forms development that you uh, uh, you might find interesting to, to to read through. It's 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 still not fully done yet, the, this book, but it's it's almost complete. So we should hopefully have it completed here within the next uh, month or two. Uh, but yeah, it is it is similar. 
Um, and uh, yeah, that's exactly how it works. Like you have a, the, all the UI interactions happen over that SignalR connection. It is, it is using SignalR under the covers to manage the WebSocket connection. Um, and it's simulating that SPA style app while still leaving all your code running on the server. And it, it gives you that light client feel. It also, you, it, it can really simplify the app architecture in a lot of ways. Um, instead of having to, like let's say you want some data like from the database, uh, in a uh, true SPA style application, well, you would have to then stand up a web API and that web API then talks to the database and you ship data back and forth between the browser and the server through like, you know, some JSON data or whatever. In a Blazor server app, you're already on the server. You have full access to all of .NET Core and all the server capabilities. So from your component code, you can go ahead and just talk to the database or talk to an arbitrary service um, and not have to jump through those additional layers, which can, can make things quite a bit easier. I think Blazor Server is really great for that quick line of business uh, application that you just want to deploy on your intranet and uh, you don't want to, you know, it doesn't need to be architected to handle like 100,000 users. You can just do, do something really, really fast and get going really quick with a, a Blazor Server application. Yeah, because I guess you're now at the limit of how many WebSocket connections you can have open at the same time. So there's That's like right. a, there's a natural limit that is different. Is that a server limit or is that a, yeah, that must be a server limit, not a browser limit because they don't exactly, have yeah. any browser, but, just have to be one. <laughs> with Blazor Server, you have to start thinking about scale out of the, the server resources because you're, you're paying with your server resources to run the UI for every connected client and you need a connection for every client. Now for the connection scale out, we actually have a, an Azure service that can help you out. The Azure SignalR service is specifically built to handle connection scale out for SignalR based apps. And it works great with Blazor server. So you can you know, okay. scale up to, to you know, tens Infinite. or hundreds of thousands of connections using the Azure SignalR service. But you'll still need them to think about the server resources to then uh, handle the, the logic for all of those connections. So people Data, that do- Database those, they, connections and all that sort of stuff. Yep. To the what, sorry? The, yeah, and potential like, your database connections and whatever other resources yes. your server is using to produce the logic. Um, okay, so that's that's good to know. So if you're willing to spend a little money to 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 adopt a service that can scale, then you're good for even the largest sites doing place of server. So we're almost out of time, and we have a few questions here. Okay. Um, so Michael asks, are there any public lists of sites using Blazor? I'm not talking. He's not talking about samples here, just but actual real world sites. Um, there, is, there isn't today, and this has been on my to-do list to put together for for a long while to have like a like a showcase or at least some published like uh, user stories or case studies uh, for applications that are using using Blazor today. There are sites out there. Um, uh, last I checked, I think the Steel Toe site um, from the what uh, from the Pivotal folks that was built on on on, on Blazor. Um, if you have a site that is public and using Blazor today, I would love to know about it. So shoot me an email or find me on Twitter, um, Dan Roth 27 on Twitter, um, where I, I am trying to put together that list and get something published so that uh, people who have very similar questions uh, can can find out about that. But it is, yeah, it is absolutely being used. We're using it internally at, at, at Microsoft as well for various projects, and uh, you can use it too. Awesome. Uh, here's another one uh, from Shady. He says, uh, is there any plan for local storage and session storage to be inside Blazor soon? So those are two browser concepts yep. uh, for storing um, any data in the browser. Um, support for uh, uh, interacting with local storage is something we actually plan to add in .NET 5. It's, uh, it's being either worked on right now or it might already be done. Uh, Steve Sanderson had put out a package for that um, some number of months ago as like an experiment, and we are planning to add that to .NET 5. Um, but you don't need to wait. Um, there are uh, several, I think, community packages out there as well that have already written the JavaScript interop code to interact with local storage and basically shrink wrapped it in a .NET C Sharp wrapper that you can then just add as a NuGet package to your application. I think Blazor has one. There's, there's a couple of them out there. So you can do it today, absolutely. But we do plan to make that a um, sort of a first class part of the, the Blazor framework. Nice. Excellent. And I think um, that's pretty much what we have for uh, the show today, we're completely out of time. Um, Dan, I will say this was a, this was a true pleasure. I now know a lot more about Blazor than I did before, and so thank you so much for coming on and explaining it all to us. You're very welcome, Mads, and I'm looking forward to seeing your your first Blazor application.
head on over to blazer.net. <laughs> you heard it, folks, blazer.net. Um, and so go check it out, try it out, let us know what you think. And, uh, you know, I'll make sure to post uh, Dan's uh, Twitter in the description below if you're on YouTube and watching this. And um, so go uh, check it out and let him know what, uh, what you think about it, ask him questions and so on. That's it for now. Thank you so much. I hope to see you again next time.